I I took um, Spanish. I wanted to at that point. I wanted to be a bilingual or two language major, and and learning Spanish was tough. So I I dropped it. Um, intro to psychology. I got a C. So I I wanted to be a psychology major. I dropped that. <laughs> I ended up by default um, being an East Asian studies major because I and a Chinese minor, because those were things I already knew. It wasn't new information. So all I had to do was just add on. That was Anne, talking about the challenge she faced at college choosing her major. Her challenge wasn't because she was a feckless student unable to pick something and stick to it, but because her undiagnosed learning disabilities made learning new subjects difficult. Textbooks were a constant battle for Anne going through school and college. After a college therapist pointed out the discrepancy between her SAT scores, she started investigating how she learned and processed information. As a result, Anne was diagnosed with dyslexia, working memory weakness, and auditory processing disorder. These learning disabilities haven't held Anne back. Today, she's a learning consultant with Ignite Consulting. In this episode of Silent Superheroes, Anne will explain how her learning disabilities led her to cheat on a school test. She'll share how dyslexia affects her physically. And finally, she'll share what businesses should be doing to make training more easy for people with learning disabilities. My name's James Pratt. I'm the host of Silent Superheroes, and I'm really glad that you're here. Welcome to the Silent Superheroes podcast, a series of frank conversations about mental health at work. Welcome to Silent Superheroes. I'm here with today's guest, Anne. Anne, welcome to the show. Thank you. So, Anne, why didn't you start by telling us just a little bit about yourself? Who are you? What do you do? So, my name's Anne, Anne Van Gessel, and uh, I grew up in Taiwan. Um, was born to a, a Dutch man and Taiwanese mom. Uh, grew up in Taiwan and uh, came here when I was 18 for college, and then been here ever since. Lately, I've been telling people I have a le- I have learning disabilities, so that's that's my new way of introducing myself, and it's not historically how I would introduce myself. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about those learning disabilities? For full disclosure, I, I recently just researched them uh, to get a better understanding. And, and the reason for that, and then I'll, I'll answer your question, um, is because I don't b- believe in labels. I, it's great that I, I got assessed, but I think I had a real resistance to being labeled um, and, and dyslexia, which is one of my learning disabilities, or all these other ones that I have. So I just wanted to share that. Uh, so uh, based on my assessment, I have dyslexia, uh, verbal learning disability, which when I Google that, it, it keeps taking me to auditory processing disorder, um, and working memory weakness. Okay. So can you say a little bit more about what each of those are? Sure. And this is based on Google, Google search. Google <laughs> is my, my best friend. Sorry, Charles. You're, you're also my best friend as well. <laughs> uh, so, uh, based, based on my research, uh, dyslexia is a learning disorder that involves difficulty reading, uh, due to problems identifying speech sounds and, and, uh, learning how they relate to letters and words in, in terms of decoding. Uh, dyslexia affects areas of the brain that process language, and it can also impact spelling. And it's actually happening right now because as I'm reading this out loud, I'm not really processing what this paragraph means. I'm focused on the pronunciation. Right, saying the words. Exactly. So I'm like, I don't know what I just read. <laughs> I I know it's accurate because I wrote <laughs> Cause it. You co- okay. Because <laughs> you copied it from Google. I exactly. Accurate, I trust right? Google. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the the verbal learning disability, um, and then um, you know, like I said, it uh, it came up as a as auditory processing disorder, and it affects how sound travels through the ear, um, is processed or interpreted by the brain, um, and and so individuals with a. PD, that's the acronym, do not recognize sub- subtle differences between sounds and words, even when the sounds are loud and clear enough to be heard. Um, 
They can also find it difficult to tell where the sounds are coming from, uh, to make sense of the order of sounds, or to block out competing background noises. Okay. Yeah. So a good thing we're in a relatively quiet area. Yeah. Presumably is, oh, helpful. absolutely. I, I mean, I take all my phone calls in in like a private area, like a phone room, in my car, in, you know, in my home when when no one else is there. Um. And then the third one is working memory weakness. Uh, so um, the, my understanding, and, and I'll explain what working memory is first. Um, it's a dynamic short-term system of limited capacity used to hold information that is being processed. So as, as I'm reading each word until the end of the sentence and paragraph and then trying to understand the full context, it's so weak that... Like by the time I read to the end of the sentence, I'm like, what the heck did I read? <laughs> I got to reread the sentence all over again. Or if it's in verbal form, and, and this really applies to new and complex information uh, because of the dyslexia, um, my vocabulary, uh, it's not like I don't know a lot of SAT words. Like I know enough to get by. <laughs> and so do, like do it's an really interesting need, combination. <laughs> do we really need SAT words? Let's no. Be honest. <laughs> We're just for showing off. <laughs> We're going to have a conversation here where there's going to be a lot of dialogue flying back and forth. Mm -hmm. What are the things that I could do to help you in this situation? Oh, well, thanks for even asking that. I mean, that's a question that I don't even get asked. So, uh, yeah, definitely articulate and then don't use those fancy SAT words. <laughs> if I think of anything, I'll definitely let you know. It's amazing that such a simple question could have such an impact on somebody i mean why wouldn't you ask somebody that question right i know like i do this podcast so you know it's it's logical that i would right I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's about how to accommodate how to support people so like yeah obviously i would ask it but that's not a hard question to ask uh i tend to mumble because i'm british i think <laughs> um so you can call me if you don't understand me okay and i'll make a special I will make a special effort not to use um, SAT words as best I can. <laughs> you talked about three different conditions there. Mm -hmm. The second you came to them later. What's been your experience of one or all of those conditions? So how I experience dyslexia, or I guess how it impacts me, it's I have difficulty learning new words and, and memorizing. Uh, reading for me is takes a long time, oftentimes and, and this really ties more with the working memory weakness. When I read a sentence, by the end of the sentence, I'm thinking to myself, or the paragraph, what the heck did I just read? And and this is really uh, talking about new and complex information. Uh, I can read about law of attraction all day, and it just makes sense to me. But Or coaching, um, but when it comes to complex information like I'll just give examples like history and science are really tough classes for me. I got either D's or C's and and um, I think those are the only two classes. Uh, word problems were hard for me too. I, I mean, math was fine until geometry. So that's a really important point because your dyslexia and working memory weakness are not showing up uniformly in all situations. Sometimes they're... Um, you know, in a history, a science class, they're really sort of showing up and making that class challenging. But it sounds like in some other areas, they don't show up mm -hmm. as much. Yeah. Which is kind of interesting. You know, I would have maybe expected that they would sort of blanket across in the same way across all mm. subjects. And uh, during the, the learning disability test, I actually tested really well for uh, visual organization and like recognizing symbols so and they also tested my iq and my iq is actually average and my well there's two pieces they, there's a verbal iq and a performance iq and and I, I sound like i know what i'm talking about but i'm just repeating what my test said and my verbal iq is average and that uh, involve or includes verbal comprehension and working memory, which are two of my culprits, I guess, so to speak. And then performance IQ, I'm actually above average. 
and that's perceptual organization and processing speed. So I I process really fast. It's just the information going in, mm. it, it it's delayed. Yeah, it's like it's going through kind of a filter, filter. or a sponge or something like that yeah. to, to get deep slowly. Yeah. How about um, the other um, condition? How does that show up? The auditory processing disorder... I sometimes it's hard for me to differentiate between two like sounding words and I have to base it on the context to figure out what the person's saying. Um, and the example uh, is like wreath and reef can sound very similar, but they're totally two different words. I think I'm saying that correctly. Like sounded, wreath is that. Yeah, it sounded good okay, to me. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> So I have a curiosity question. Uh, you uh, have a Taiwanese mother, mm -hmm. and I'm willing to bet you speak Chinese. Mm -hmm. I do. And so um, I have tried to learn Chinese more than once and failed this morning. <laughs> and what generally trips me up is the fact that you can have one word with four different sounds yeah, to it. So how totally. do you deal with that, given this auditory processing yeah. disorder? And, and it's interesting you bring that up because the – assessment they're saying it could be you know the our learning disability or it could be that i grew up trilingual because i i also knew taiwanese i mean it's another dialect of chinese but it sounds totally different i grew up speaking it so there's a little bit of like inbuilt memorization it's not new memorization and and i'm so grateful for that because otherwise Mandarin is a hard language to learn. So let's go back in time. You grew up with a Taiwanese mother, a Dutch father, and at some point on that journey, these conditions must have started showing up, even though you didn't know what they were at the time. So kind of walk us through that history a little bit. The first memory I can think of is in middle school, and uh, we were learning SAT words. And, and those were really hard for me. Um, I... I was not doing well in them, and I, I I tried my best. I really did, and I was so frustrated uh, to the point that I actually cheated on a test, and I got caught, um, and then I didn't cheat again. Uh, so that that was an outcome. I felt like I needed to cheat to 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 do well because there was no other other way at, at the time. You felt so behind in some way, mm -hmm. even though I was spending my own time attempting to learn these words like I had flashcards I my um, I had people you know test the flashcards and and just other people were getting it a lot faster how did your parents react to you can quote cheating um I don't remember exactly how my parents reacted I just remember people in general reacted in the sense that I'm not working hard enough so let's take you on a little bit so that was your first moment of not knowing why, but feeling like, hey, something's different here. Mm -hmm. How did it go from there? What happened next? In high school, I uh, I remember I was taking chemistry. I think I took physics too. Uh, I like to keep out unnecessary or not useful information and then history as well. And I just remember I was getting either C or D and, and the text was overwhelming. I just... It, um, I would read and it wouldn't really make sense. And, and it made me tired. Um, I, I remember my dad took me to see the vice superintendent. They're, they're really good friends. So it wasn't like, oh, you're in trouble. Just uh, kind of getting some help. Um, and they would um, teach me to maybe s skim or scan and... Um, try to come up with like a like a main main theme and and actually that was helpful so uh i i actually do that as a compensation i would i would kind of skim through really quickly just get the high level and but the unfortunate part is you you're you're left out with a lot of detail that could be important but at least i got the gist and that helps with the working memory weakness it's so interesting that you can process all that quickly and pull out the bits that are you know, the high level stuff again that seems counterintuitive when the dyslexia makes it harder for you to process words Does that make sense yeah it, 
I mean, it comes with a catch because sometimes you you could come out with an inaccurate outcome, but I just do my best. It's it it seems to work better than just reading each word and then forgetting what I read. And um, I mean, I'll, I'll still go back and reread. Presumably, things like this kept showing up in mm-hmm. your in your life. Like, what are some other key moments on that journey? And then next was college, and then the you know the books got. Well, actually, no, about the same. The same, <laughs> little, little thicker, more of them, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I, I just remember um, again. It was always the history and science classes. I took intro to nutrition and that was an actual science science class um, because I'm really interested in wellness and nutrition that class was so hard and uh, history again was tough and anything relating to a lot of text um, like social studies or uh, and then also I I took um, Spanish I wanted to at that point I wanted to be a bilingual or two language major and and learning Spanish was tough, so I, I dropped it. Um, intro to psychology, I got a C, so I, I wanted to be a psychology major. I dropped that. <laughs> I ended up by default um, being an East Asian Studies major because I and a Chinese minor because those were things I already knew. It wasn't new information, so all I had to do was just add on. Um, and I just remember constantly being tired uh especially during winter break or summer break i i have memories of sleeping 12 hours and my parents would ask like are you okay and and actually now that i think about it because reading and processing is exhausting <laughs> and uh, i mean for me so no wonder i'm i'm tired i or i was so tired i wonder why do you have any sense why that is in a dyslexic brain that you become tired from from reading i'll notice that there's a part of my brain that's working so hard yeah. and 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 it's actually the focus piece um i i when it's i don't want to call it boring text but like to me if it's hard and complex it's 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 uh, for some reason i um I just, I can't, it's hard to focus. I have to force myself to focus. And it's almost like your brain is saying, take a break. I think <laughs> that focus is like, we don't want to be here. We need to be. Oh, it's absolutely right saying that. And I'm fighting that every second of the way. So through high school, uh, through middle school, high school, college, mm-hmm. there were evidently issues that were making it harder for you mm-hmm. to succeed. Oh yeah. It got even harder. Yeah. Yeah. So, kind of, but you graduated college. I did. Right. And grad school. And grad school. <laughs> I, as you said, I guess you love to learn. I do. Even though it's hard. On its own, that's, I don't know if impressive is the right word or commendable. I'm trying not to use SAT words here. But like, <laughs> that's impressive to get through all those steps whilst there are a number of things that are working mm-hmm. against you. How do you think about that? Uh, I mean, I I know a common th- feedback that I I get is that I have perseverance and strength, so I I know that to be true, and um, that I have motivation, so I have that going for me. And um, the lady who did my assessment says I have a good attitude. <laughs> so, so at some point in the future, you can tell an employer like I have a certified good attitude. Yeah. Like, look, this this doctor told me. Um, yeah, she is a doctor. There you go. So the doctor <laughs> says you've got a good attitude. You've got a good attitude. Let's do a thought experiment and go back in time and like take away the perseverance that you mm. have. So you're somebody else, same set of conditions, less perseverance. How is your life different? I think I would have given up, but my parents are pretty convincing. So they want me to succeed. And so they would have continued... Um, I, they would make sure I, I succeed. But then I could see um, a lot of resentment and 
Um, it, I don't think it would it would turn out well. I mean, I think it'd be just be grumpy, and then no one would want to interact with me. So what I'm taking away from this is that you know it is perfectly possible to navigate these conditions as many many people do but you probably need something else that helps you get there mm-hmm. like perseverance or family that you know, really cares about you oh, and definitely. just kind of propels propels you on yeah family close friends i mean uh, cheerleaders so at what point in time did you um get the the label for the three conditions that you have so this happened in college. I um, so I'm a self help junkie. In in college, I sought out a, a therapist because I wanted to continue my self growth and understand myself. And we just we just started having um, random conversations. I mean, it started off being conversations about you know how how to get along with my roommates, how my life's going freshman year of college, and then. Then she, we started talking about uh, maybe my difficulty in classes, um, and then she asked me what my SAT scores were, <laughs> that damn SAT, and my verbal was 520, and my math was 720, and she said that's quite a difference, even though I, I mean, it's just 200 points, but I mean, I, what do I know? Well, or 25% of the scale, right? Isn't eight hundred uh, the top? Yeah, eight hundred the top. Yeah, so yeah, and so she said that's a huge discrepancy. Discrepancy, and um, you know, you might have a learning disability. You know, we can get you uh, an appointment and get tested. Uh, and and so I, I was curious, and I said, sure, let's you know, let's see what comes out of that. And so it was. Um, I forget if it was a half day or a whole day, but it was at least six hours of testing. Um, and that's, that's how I came to those three levels or labels. <laughs> and what was the test like? What do you, you said six hours? What do you do during those six hours? Um, so I don't remember all of it. I, what I do remember is there were, there were a couple tests, uh, where, um, so there's a, a body of text and then there were questions and there were two different types. Uh, and this is just one one section. One is you can still refer to the text when you're answering the questions, and then the ne- the other one is you you don't. And when I could refer to the text, I did very well. But, but when she took away the text, I couldn't answer the questions. So that really uh, points to the working memory or, working or memory. Weakness. Uh, weakness, or yeah. or actually the, the dyslexia is supposedly like you have difficulty memorizing. So it's actually a little bit of both. Um, she also would read me a t- uh, list of of um, uh, words depending on different categories, and then have me repeat back to her. And I did terrible on those, um, but I also did really well on like perception or visual uh, perception or organization. Um, yeah, so there, there are parts I, I, I did well on as well, which I don't remember which ones. <laughs> right. So how did it change how you approached your college work and then your work in the world? Hmm. I, I don't know if it changed anything to be honest. And, um, because I, I had, I like, so let me let me say this. I got this really useful information and I never really used it cuz I keep it a secret. And I actually think um it's not a good thing at all cuz people do experience some of these um the the impact of these disabilities and then they get frustrated. And so I think by communicating that I have them, it actually gives clarity and um, understanding. Because my initial resistance to speaking about them is um, I- I'm, af- I'm afraid that I'll be, I'll be seen different. Um, and, and, and as a kid, you just want to fit in. And I think as an adult, too. Um, although now I'm like, okay, just I just want to be myself. <laughs> and that's what these stories are all about. At first, 
telling the story, but also allowing you and other people who live, you know, with these conditions you live with, feel more comfortable in being themselves and maybe just less alone. Maybe mm. part of it is because you never talk about it. Mm-hmm. You don't know there are other people out there who are actually having very similar experiences mm-hmm. to you. What has stopped you from talking about these conditions? Not wanting to be seen as as incapable or stupid. It's like, oh, you have, oh, can you do the work? And, and this is really, uh, this is in regards to the working memory weakness. And um, I just want to share that the delay in being able to use the information can be frustrating and sometimes it can um, lead to anxiety. And, and it could also look like I'm being in, um, not attentive because I look like I'm sort of spacing out. You know, just I, I I feel like people will get. This is just my perception that um, people will get anxious, and and I mean I've seen those reactions, and and maybe I, I anticipate those reactions in everyone, yeah. even though that's that hasn't been the case. So you've chosen not to talk about um, dyslexia, um, auditory processing disorder, uh, working memory weakness in general. Despite not talking about them, are there things that you've done to adapt to those conditions mm-hmm. in your work in your at college? So most challenging, I would say it depends on the environment because, um, and, and this might go back to how I compensate. So um, w- when I'm reading really or new or complex text, I get tired and um, a, a lot of times people will go to caffeine and, and I, um, caffeine and I, it's, it's sort of a love hate relationship and it, it gets my heart pounding really fast. And, and, um, so it doesn't really make me alert. It just makes me anxious. I mean, it gives me a little bit of alertness. Um, but what I really need is just to be doing something different or getting up and exercising. And um, uh, I'm not saying all jobs are like that and are in the like like nine to five. I I would say there, I think there's still an unspoken expectation to, to sit there and, and, and get your work done. And for me, um, I need a lot of flexibility. And in the past it's been seen as slacking off. Like why is she, going to go work out or why is she you know going to go do that and and self-care is just so important to me so self-care for you is the key to being able to work successfully with Mm -hmm. dyslexia and these other two issues yeah i mean i feel my best too i mean that's that's the other reason too it's great So looking at your LinkedIn profile, it seems like you've done lots of different things. Mm-hmm. You were a consultant at Accenture. What other jobs have you done? Mm-hmm. So before that, this is where I've done various um, different types of jobs and explored a little bit as well. So before Accenture, I worked as an um, underwriter's assistant. And then I also taught Chinese class and I, I was a note taker. Um, for people with disabilities at Bellevue College. I think that's that's it, yeah. And then now I'm a learning consultant. Nice. Yeah. Where at? Oh, I currently work at Indigo Slate. You said that you work in a learning role right yeah. now. Mm-hmm. So that's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah, part of my role is to learn. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Say more about, about that. The client that I'm working with, um, working... Uh, with their partners to to ensure that they're cloud cloud certified yeah and so i'm i'm co- i'm currently learning about the different the different cloud solutions and and that's new a new area for me so you learn to help other people learn yeah <laughs> so i'll point out the obvious paradox of that which is you have a love of learning but learning can be challenging <laughs> for you mm-hmm. so how did you end up 
doing that work? How did you decide to put yourself in that position? Well, this opportunity sort of just showed up and, and I'm really grateful for that. I think of myself as a filter because if I can consume the information, I can spit it out uh, more easily consumable. <laughs> I see. <laughs> so your so difficulty you have sometimes with learning helps simplify things for other people yeah. and like just pull out the key pieces. Exactly. Take all the yeah. SAT words out. Yeah, and all totally. That. And wow. and I think that's really valuable because I mean, you know, you have the learning disabilities, then you have people that um, are, you know, English is a second language, and it's I don't I don't want to say it's apples to apples. Um, I, I I can just see how it's it can be a similar experience for 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 people who don't speak English. And, or they're just learning English and, or, or for young, young people, you know, they're just starting to, to learn the language as well. And, and if, if I can consume it and understand it, I can make it accessible for everybody or not everybody, but as many more people. Yeah. Have you explained to this employer that you have these conditions? Yeah, so um, my manager knows, and um, my my client knows as well, and therefore they understand the gift that they have, right? Which is somebody who, through the process of learning, naturally has to simplify things. I don't know if they know that. <laughs> well, we should tell them <laughs> because if I'm doing that job, I have to think about how to make it simpler. If you're doing that job, you are naturally having to simplify mm -hmm. stuff for your own benefit and then ultimately for other people's benefit, mm -hmm. which is cool, mm -hmm. I think. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it, it actually is aligned with my ultimate goal for just as, as being here um, on this planet is um, my goal is equity, to, to give everyone what they need to be successful. Because I, I, I really do see that, that it's possible. I love that that goal you delivered completely unbounded. <laughs> like, I'm just going to make equity for everybody. <laughs> that's, that's all I'm going to do. That's awesome. Everyone needs something different. And we don't all work the same. So if I were an employer putting together a learning program for something, like we're teaching new managers how to be managers, mm -hmm. how should I design that course to best accommodate somebody who has um, you know, dyslexia, uh, working memory, weakness, and uh, auditory processing disorder? I, w I would say um, make the, tr the training experiential as much as possible. And then, yeah, I would say a lot of, a lot of just learning by doing and maybe, maybe don't cram the training all in like a thing like at one hour and, and speed through it. Give it time. Although, I mean, I know time is the most valuable. But is it, is it the right trade off to speed through something? And as a result, somebody doesn't get anything from it, doesn't learn or develop versus slowing down and making sure that everybody mm -hmm. understands what it is that needs to be understood. I, I totally agree with you. And, and I think a lot of people don't see that. They think if we, if we go through this quicker, the quicker they're going to get it. If you could go back in time and tell the counselor mm -hmm. who said, hey, I think you might have a learning disability, something. And a good attitude. And a good attitude. <laughs> <laughs> I see what really stuck out of that. <laughs> uh, what would you tell her? Anything? Just what would I tell yeah, her? Yeah, you can say anything. I mean, honestly, I'd like to see her now because I, I want more clarity because I honestly think I'm really um, taking a good look now because I've, I've kind of buried this and not thought about, like I said, I think I said this earlier, not how can I, how can I learn better in like especially in corporations, but I keep thinking about all the roadblocks I keep hitting. Okay. So what would you ask? Can I contact you in 10 years? <laughs> <laughs> that is an excellent question. Let's do the same exercise with you. You can go back to a point in time of your choice, you know, in your life timeline, and you can give yourself a, a message. Where are you going to go and what are you going to say? 
I mean, I understand the background of that mes- message, but and at the same time, I'm thinking like everything unfolded unfolded the way it needed to be. Because, I mean, I can go back in time and tell myself, "Hey, you got this," mm-hmm. and like, don't worry. Um, but I don't know if it would really have done anything. It's cool. So you don't need to go back in time. You're happy exactly as you are. Yeah, I think so. That's great. Anything else you want to say before we wrap up? Yeah, I'm actually I'm really grateful for you to invite me here because um, for multiple reasons, but the one I'm going to share specifically is this got me to dig out <laughs> my assessment and um, look into my scores of of my IQ, and I'm actually smart, <laughs> and I, I share that because. Um, I didn't think I was smart for the longest time. Um, I thought there was only one kind of smart, like you, you, if you were able to memorize really quickly, or if you were able to, um, yeah, if someone said something to you, you would able to respond really quickly right after that meant you were smart because those were the places I had difficulty. And I was like, oh my God, (laughs) I am not that smart. I, I know I always thought I was like EQ smart and like I just em- had empathy. But it, but then I looked at my scores and I'm like, well, actually, I mean, not that this means anything, but it, it helps. <laughs> anything else you want to say before we wrap up? Oh. Covered it all. I think so. Um, well, and thank you for making time to come on the show. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. And that was Anne's story. There's nothing particularly unusual about the learning disabilities she manages. The University of Michigan estimates between 5 and 10% of people are dyslexic. 2 to 3% of children have auditory processing disorder, according to the American Speech Language Hearing Association. Estimates of working memory weakness seem a bit more opaque, but there are a lot of articles in different parts of the world telling teachers how to spot it, so it must be fairly common. With so many people managing these conditions, you'd think that there is a path or a method for managing them. And you'd be wrong. Like so many of the mental conditions we talk about in Silent Superheroes, managing dyslexia, APD, and WMW is a never-ending quest of trying new pathways, seeing where they take you, and backtracking when they don't work. Let's look at Anne's journey. She has a good attitude, as diagnosed by a doctor. The good attitude path takes us in the right direction, plus 10 points. Now let's take the cheating at a test path. Dang, got caught. Minus 20 points. Won't do that again. Got good parental support rather than being shouted at for being stupid? Well done. Plus 15 points. Congratulations, Anne. You're net positive five points. You get to go live a comfortable life. I don't say that to denigrate Anne. It wasn't until I was writing this that it occurred to me, everyone finds their own path. For some people, some of the path is pre-laid with tiles, like Anne's good attitude and a functional family. For other people, there's a pit of bad circumstances they have to fill in before they can even start laying the path to manage dyslexia. This is the equity Anne considers to be her life's work. Her dyslexia hasn't held her back too much because of some of the lucky circumstances she didn't control. But that's not true for everyone. In an equitable world, like the one Anne envisages, everyone gets the support they need to start from the same place as everyone else. In Anne's equitable world, the person faced with that pit they have to fill in before they can tackle dyslexia get some help to get to the same place that Anne started. When you think of it that way, it's easy to see why equitability is Anne's life goal. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, please consider sharing it with a friend or family member. You can also leave a rating or a review on iTunes or wherever it is that you get your podcasts. If you want to hear about new episodes as they come out, you can follow us at Facebook at facebook.com forward slash silent superheroes, or you can sign up for our newsletter at silentsuperheroes.com. Take your mental health seriously. If you need to speak to someone, you can call 1-800-273-8255 or text crisistextline.org at 741-741. Both provide 24-7 confidential counseling 
people in the United States. Worldwide, visit IASP.info slash resources slash crisis underscore centers slash. To help others find the Silent Superheroes podcast, please leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcasting service.